Today's lecture focuses on transitional justice mechanisms. We'll consider various forms of accountability for past human rights violations at the national level in domestic legal systems. So what exactly do we mean by transitional justice? What does that phrase imply? Well, it implies some kind of measures that are adopted in domestic legal systems in response to human rights violations or atrocities committed by a prior government and its officials. Now, this is after that government has transitioned or is no longer in power. And the new government, very often a democracy, or at least uh, transitioning to democracy, has a number of measures that it might adopt in order to deal with the legacy of past violations. And I've shown you here four of them. Criminal prosecutions, truth commissions, civil damage actions, and some sort of possibly amnesty for the perpetrators. Obviously, that is somewhat different than the other three options in these boxes. Amnesty would mean that there would be no criminal prosecution or perhaps civil damage actions from the perpetrators of the human rights violations. We'll consider in a moment why amnesty might be a choice that new governments transitioning to democracy might make. The overarching questions that we'll consider this week are what are the goals of each of these different measures and are the measures compatible with each other? Might these four options in the boxes be a kind of menu from which governments could choose more than one option to promote transitional justice? And in the second half of the lecture we'll consider whether international law ought to limit these options available to national governments. That is, if governments decide that amnesty and a truth commission is appropriate, ought that to be a decision that international courts and review bodies respect. Let's turn first to a discussion of truth commissions in South Africa. This is an extremely famous example. It's also an early example from the mid-1990s as South Africa was transitioning from the apartheid regime to majority black rule, the question arose what to do with those government officials that perpetrated or carried out apartheid. And that issue very quickly came before South Africa's new constitutional court. We've read decisions of that court before. And now I'm, I'll invite you to read another one, the Azanian People's Organization case, which you can find on the Coursera webpage. Once you have read the excerpt of this decision, please continue the lecture. Let's first take a look at some of the factual allegations and legal claims. Here the applicants are challenging the decision of the post-apartheid government to create a Truth and Reconciliation Commission, or TRC, as part of South Africa's move to a new society that's racially integrated and has majority rule. The applicants, however, are not happy with that, and they turn to Section 22 of the new Constitution, which provides what seems to give them a right of access to the court or other independent or impartial forum. And the applicants rely on this provision to say there ought to be criminal prosecutions of those who were the perpetrators of apartheid, and we deserve compensation for the injuries we suffered. And to be clear, some of those injuries included arbitrary detention, torture, cruel, inhuman, or degrading treatment, systematic racial discrimination, and so forth. So these are very serious claims. And yet the new constitutional court rejects the applicant's claims. It decides that the Truth and Reconciliation Commission's can continue. So why might that be the case? Well, first, I think we need to spend some time understanding what the goals of the truth and reconciliation process might be. And I've listed many of them here, which are referred to both in the South African Constitutional Court's opinion and in other sources. So uh, specifically, the Constitutional Court refers to the overarching goal of promoting national reconciliation and unity, Ubuntu, and to facilitating the transition to democracy. The concern here would be that if there were a kind of victor's justice by those who are now in power, 
that there would not be a stable transition, that it would lead to cycles of violence and revenge, and that would be the wrong path forward for South Africa. On the other hand, a truth and reconciliation process does acknowledge the harms to victims in the past, and it does provide a forum, not a judicial one as such, but, but a, a structured forum in which victims can account their, recount their past abuses, confront their perpetrators directly, and hopefully be able to achieve some kind of closure and move forward in a, a harmonious way. Now, one of the key points about how a truth and reconciliation process works, especially in this context of South Africa, is that it promotes the disclosure of information about abuses by perpetrators. Now, you might be wondering, how is it that we could have this sort of disclosure? Why, after all, would perpetrators agree to talk about past crimes? Admittedly, actions that were not criminal under the apartheid regime, but that were crimes under international law, and uh, certainly require some sort of moral accountability. Why would they disclose these uh, activities? Well, the truth and reconciliation process provides a mechanism for granting amnesty to perpetrators in exchange for a full accounting of past violations during the apartheid regime. And amnesty provides the incentive for disclosure, and it also increases the likelihood that there will be a true accounting, a faithful accounting, of the crimes committed during apartheid. And that uh, is a very important function of a truth and reconciliation process. It provides a mechanism whereby those who have the greatest knowledge about past violations come forward voluntarily to explain what might otherwise not be fully explainable. It may have been that records have been destroyed, or that certain uh, other perpetrators are not interested in coming forward or have, have died or emigrated. And so this mechanism allows for the disclosure of information, and that disclosure of truthful information might be necessary for national reconciliation. But it's certainly the case that the South African Constitutional Court says that amnesty alone would be problematic it would likely be contrary to the provision of the Constitution referred to earlier. But when the benefits of truth and reconciliation and disclosure, conditional amnesty for disclosure, are taken into account, then that might, in fact, and according to the court, in this instance, does justify limiting criminal prosecutions and victims' right of access to court. And so the Constitutional Court comes to a decision that gives some deference to the political process for how South African society ought to move forward after the horrors of the apartheid regime. Now you might be wondering, well, might some of the goals of the Truth Commission process be possible in criminal proceedings? In other words, why not use criminal prosecutions to achieve those same objectives? Would that be possible? And the answer is in part, but not in whole. So criminal trials can create an official record of past atrocities. That's something a truth commission can do. They certainly assign individual responsibility for past uh, violations uh, and abuses. And in doing so, they deter retaliation and revenge by victims especially group-based retaliation. So by having an identified perpetrator who has been found through a judicial process with all of those safeguards entailed in that process, has been found uh, to have committed violations, then this might be a way to channel the anger and the hatred and the desire for some kind of compensation or remedy for the past violations. On the other hand, what criminal trials can't do in the same way is disclose full information. So this is somewhat in tension with the idea of creating an official record, the first point under what criminal trials can do. So let me explain. So in a criminal proceeding, a defendant has a strong incentive to avoid criminal punishment, not to disclose 
information. And indeed, many legal systems do not require defendants to uh, testify at their own trials. So the absence of a voluntary disclosure of information and a full accounting of past abuses is lacking in criminal trials. Moreover, criminal trials have different objectives to be sure that an individual who is alleged to have committed a crime did in fact commit that crime, and thus they have higher standards of evidence and evidentiary proof than do truth commissions. They also, again because of the processes and safeguards they contain, because someone's liberty is at issue perhaps uh, for many years, they, are, they tend to be more expensive uh, more time-consuming involve, and involve the, the prosecution of fewer perpetrators. So if the goal is to have a broader understanding of past violations and to bring in a very large number of perpetrators into that process, then perhaps truth commissions are a superior way of proceeding. So this, in a sense, is why a number of societies, South Africa being one of the earliest, but others in Latin America, in Africa, in Asia, have chosen to move forward with truth commissions, either in addition to or instead of criminal trials. And the question then we now need to consider is, ought there be some restriction on the ability of governments in a transitional situation to decide between criminal trials and truth commissions, or perhaps to use both. Let me uh, now share with you some of the basic rules about how international law is addressing that question. So to recap, the decision of whether to grant amnesty and create a truth commission process for past violations is made initially at the national level by the new democratic government. But the validity of that decision, in particular the issue of amnesty, is potentially subject to review at the international level by UN treaty bodies and regional human rights commissions and courts, which we've previously studied. And over time, as a number of these commissions, courts, and, and treaty bodies have reviewed amnesties and truth and reconciliation processes, they have narrowed the circumstances in which such amnesties are permissible and instead begun to favor the prosecution of those who've committed the violations and the compensation of victims. Let me give you a few examples and now we'll enter into some terrain that I think is quite contested and, and quite controversial. So in early days, early decisions that were reviewing amnesties came to the view that certain kinds of amnesties were legally suspect and thus impermissible. So-called self-amnesties, those adopted by uh, an autocratic or military dictatorship while still in power, that is to say before we leave office we will give ourselves amnesty that will last after we leave office. International human rights courts and review bodies said that that was highly problematic given the very skewed incentives toward self-protection that the, uh, am those kinds of amnesties would provide. Also automatic amnesties, those were give that were given without some kind of quid pro quo of a disclosure through a truth commission or other kind of disclosure rule. And finally, amnesties for the most serious international violations, use cogens or peremptory norm violations, those could not be permitted. So you would not be able to have an amnesty for genocide or slavery and so forth. More recent decisions, however, have begun to adopt a more categorical approach. So even if, for example, an amnesty or a truth commission was, in, was adopted by a democratic process, that is by the government that was accountable to the people after a regime change, then that would not be permissible as well, according to these more recent decisions. And indeed, even less serious violations of international law and domestic law might be beyond amnesty. And a current controversy that I'd like to share with you before concluding the lecture concerns the situation of transitional justice in Brazil. In 2012, the president of Brazil established a truth commission to investigate torture, 
forced disappearance and murders committed during the military dictatorship in that country from the end of the Second World War through to 1988. The commission has a number of powers to subpoena testimony, to hold public and private hearings, to access government documents from this dictatorship period. The commission would then, on the basis of the evidence it gathered, on the basis of witnesses and others coming forward, issue a report to the president by the end of 2014. However, no criminal prosecutions are contemplated. Now, why might that be? Well, here there was what looks to be a self-amnesty law in the sense that it was adopted in 1979 before the end of the military dictatorship, but it had been subsequently upheld much more recently by the Supreme Court of Brazil. However, in 2010, that amnesty law was reviewed again, this time by the Inter-American Court of Human Rights, and was found to violate the rights in that regional human rights convention. So now we have a situation in which the national government does not believe that prosecutions are appropriate. The international court, in this case the Inter-American Court, says they are required by international human rights law. And in the meanwhile, we have an ongoing truth commission process. And this raises really a quite fundamental question. Should Brazil's decision to pursue transitional justice using a truth commission with the uh, powers of inquiry and investigation that that commission has, should that be uh, respected as compared to criminal prosecutions against the perpetrators of the crimes you saw earlier during the military dictatorship period? The answer to this question, I think, is really quite challenging. If you adopt a perspective that says making the victims whole or the victims' families whole for past violations and establishing criminal accountability is what is paramount, then having some criminal process and some compensation for the victims would be the preferred solution. And that would lead to a, the answer to this question being no, Brazil's decision to follow truth commission process, the Truth Commission process is uh, not legally permissible. On the other hand, when you consider that criminal prosecutions would be with respect to events that had occurred 20 or 30 or 40 years earlier, that might seem to be a problematic way to proceed. After all, the witnesses might not be available. Uh, the defendants who were brought to trial might resist disclosure of information. They would have every incentive to do so. And thus, to the extent that Brazil's society was interested in uncovering the past abuses that had occurred and understanding why they occurred, criminal trials might be problematic for some of the reasons that we discussed earlier. Now, I want to be clear that I, it, it could be possible to have a, a, a dual process. There could be a, a process that would have some uh, features of a truth commission and some prosecutions. Those prosecutions might occur for those who are most responsible. Uh, they might occur after the truth commission process had concluded and identified with some degree of certainty which of the individuals were most responsible. So this is not an either or question. But the Inter-American Court has essentially said prosecutions must go forward. Thus far, Brazil has not complied with that decision, in part because they are waiting, I think, to see the outcome of the Truth Commission process at the end of 2014. I'll leave you at the end of this lecture with a number of additional sources that you can consult for more information on these fascinating and challenging topics.